Psalm 100, Psalm number 100 in the Old Testament, the book is Psalm, the number is 100. Anointed name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and we ask it all. 
Psalms. It is number 16, Psalm number 16. We'll be looking at verses 9, 10, and 11. Psalm number 16, verses 9, 10, and 11. This is where he stands at, and he write it here. It's a good place to stand. Psalm number 16, verses 9, 10, and 11. When you found it, you will discover these words. Therefore, my heart is glad 
and my glory rejoices. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol or hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. I want to talk about God's path of life. God's path of life. God's path. We are always looking for a path by which we should take. We're always looking for the right way to walk. Am I right? We're always looking for a right way to turn, a right move, or a right statement to make. Yes, sir. And we only are able to do it rightly if we serve and obey the righteous God. God has a pathway to life. God has created a pathway by which we can follow and we should follow. Our cycling group used this scripture as our first scripture. Psalm 16 and 11. And we are reciting it every Saturday. We're, we're studying it during the week and we're meditating on it. Verse 11 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence, Lord, there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're looking when men look for women, boys look for girls, they are looking for a pathway of life. Many of us and many of you have gotten to a point where you're too old to play games. And let me tell you, sister, there are some brothers who have some game. And the sisters are saying, and one have said already, you're trying to, you're trying to play the game on a game player. You can't play the player, man. Oh, no, that's right. Play the player. And I dare tell you, brothers, there are some sisters who have game. All right. And you would think after the age of 18, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and some 70 and 80 that you would have gotten past the game. I mean, Shucking and jiving ought to be done with you and you ought to be done with it. You ought to be over those sayings like, wherever you going, I want to go, baby. <laughs> you, ought to, you ought to have gotten past the statement that heaven must be missing an angel because you're here with me right now. <laughs> you ought to have have gotten passed by now. Statement that tell your neighbor that you're going to be the best neighbor in town and you have turned into the most rotten neighbor that's ever been. Men who are married, ought to, they ought to understand by now that men can't handle but a half a woman. We can't, I mean, sisters, I'm just going to, it's, it's true confession. My time is all comprehensive. Yes, sir. My time is locked down. All right. We're trying to please one. The songwriter said, it wasn't, it wasn't the songwriter that wrote Amazing Grace either. The songwriter says, trying to love too. Show ain't easy to do. We ought to get past the game. We, we ought to get past the showboat. We, 
We ought to get past unnecessary stuff. We ought to, that's why I tell people, spend at least a few months getting to know him. Because he can fake it for a week, he can fake it for a month. But a year long, he's still faking it, let me tell you. <laughs> Give him 50 feet. I want to tell you today that if he or she is not on the path with God, not on the path for God, not walking on behalf of God, and his mannerism doesn't tell you all, move across, move over, move on. God has a path of life. And we have to make sure that we teach our children at an early age to follow God's path of life. That's why I've been saying for the last 18, nearly 18 years, that we have to make sure that our children get very familiar with the book of Proverbs. And now I'm saying even 18 years later, we have to make sure that our children get familiar with Proverbs, and we need to make sure that our seniors get familiar with Proverbs. For in it lies life. In the book of Proverbs lies wisdom. The wise writer says, wisdom is chasing you down. Wisdom is looking for you. It is just a wise woman or a wise man, a wise boy or girl that will choose wisdom even at an early age. You have, to, you have to be really, really keyed in to who God is. You know, we can fake it on Sunday. We get our makeup working. We get our shoes shined. We get our, we get our posture on. And folk who think they're really holy, they can really look ugly. They, they think that the, when you look like something's stinking, you holy. I grew up and I watched, I watched people serving communion, serving, serving the, the Lord's Supper. I, I watched them in their service. And man, first of all, it was scary to me because they came out with a, a sheet covering communion. And there was a, there was a, a, a piece sticking up here, a piece sticking up here, in a curve right here. I said, oh man, they're walking here with a dead folk, dead person covered up. Because it looks just like a body. And it didn't look like the body of Jesus. And when they walked in, they could really look sanctimonious. And they looked like they were smelling something that was real stinky. And people who think they are holy, they can look down their nose at you like they just stepped off a cloud. And they want you to think that they have the, the pathway of life that God has chosen. But the fact of the matter is, if you can't hang out with the jokers in the gutter, you can't hang out with the folk in the penthouse either. Because God has created a path of life where we all realize that we are all on the same level when it comes to God. We're at the foot of the cross. We are, we are not any more than anybody else. But let me tell you, when a person's been saved two days, they can tell you, now I, I'm saved. I'm sanctified and woo, I'm filled with the precious Holy Ghost. And they will let you know that because I'm saved, girl, you ought to stop hanging out like you. And they were just out there last night with you. Well, my Lord. They come to the conclusion that because they're saved, they know the whole Bible and they know what everybody else ought to do. So they begin to cut people off that who have gotten them where they are. People who have put up with you through your mess. But now you know the Lord. <laughs> and because you know the Lord, none of your family members who are caught in sin are good enough to, for you to hang out with. Let me tell you, if, if you are so saved, 
you ought to be able to go to the nightclub and save some folk. And you ought not get to stomp into the music when you get caught up. You ought to have a, a mission. You ought to be on a mission to reach folk for Jesus Christ. And while they are doing their thing, you ought to be able to stand it and minister to them. I remember my first year here in Houston. I, I had my bachelor pad. And a guy wanted to come over who was a seven-day Adventist. And, uh, you know, they want to have Bible study with you. I'm already saved. I'm already born again. And I said, okay, come on. And because it was my bachelor pad, it was one of those little round glass tables that I had paid $80 for at the flea market. And this is a big old huge guy. And he came over, and because I wasn't giving in to his shenanigans, he took his hand, his fist, and his wrist and hit down on my $80 brand new glass table. I said, well, I tell you what, I don't know who your Jehovah is, but I know you're getting ready to get out of here. Because when we're saved, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit holds our reins. He keeps us out of stuff. And some of you already said, you've already said, you've already said, hold me, Holy Ghost. I was in a church one time and the pastor walked in his office and his wife was sitting in his chair. And Sister Davis was there. His wife was sitting in his chair. He walks in the door in front of everybody. He said, what are you doing? Asked the question, what are you doing sitting in my chair? And she looked up toward heaven. And said, hold me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> that told me right there, that little bitty woman was about to let loose on him if the Holy Ghost had not held her. <laughs> and if his chair, his throne is so sanctimonious that no one else can sit there. I want to tell you, we need to follow God's path of life. When we look at verse number one, when we look at verse number one, it says, preserve me, O God, for you I put my trust in, or some commentators say, or some versions say, it's in you that I put my trust. In you I put my trust, Lord. My first point is, God has preservation power. I thank God for his preservation, for his ability to preserve me. This word preserve means to, to, hand, to hinge about me. It means that God will reserve me in the midst of trouble. It means that, that God will regard me regardless of what's going on around me. He says, Keep me. This word preserve means that God will keep me and watch over me. Is God preserving you? Don't you thank God for his preservation? Let me just tell you, if you don't think that God is preserving you, over 700,000 folk have died in America from one disease. Let me tell you, regardless of how holy you are or how unholy you are, it's God who has preserved you. He keeps us. Because we can't keep ourselves. It, and it doesn't matter how many jobs you have. It doesn't matter how, many, how much money you have. It doesn't matter what your retirement looks like. That stuff could be gone in a blink of an eye. We have to put passwords and key things up. Because, you know, in this electronic world, you will, your whole life saving will be wiped out. In the blink of an eye. But God has preserved us. The psalmist, David, David recognized that God is the one who preserves us. This everlasting God, this God who, who was here before he got here, he preserves us. Somebody in this room today thought your, your degree preserved you. Somebody thought that, that your smartness preserved you. Let me tell you, God and God alone preserves us. He, he reserves us for later on. He, he puts a hedge of protection 
around us. He, he blesses us in spite of us. You're not so good that you deserve to be here. You're not so good that, that you walk so uprightly before God that God has, has given you carte blanche to be present now. Every morning, he gives us new mercies. Even though to us it's the same thing that he does for us, but he gives us new mercies every morning. The mercy that you had this morning, you didn't deserve it. Somebody didn't receive it, but God just kept you on planet Earth. He kept you breathing. He, he kept you about his business. It says, oh God, for you, I put my trust. So if God is the one with the preserving power, you ought to trust in him and in him alone. Do you trust in God? I, I trust in God. I, I trust in God. The songwriter declares that I trust him wherever I may be. Yes, sir. Even in the raging sea, I trust in God. Yes, sir. We used to, used to go, go, go fishing and, and, uh, and uh, Brother Miles, Brother Nan Law, Brother J.R. Richard and I, I had to tell J.R., man, you can't get your pastor out here on this water and laugh at him because he can't catch the fish that you catch. <laughs> Matter of fact, I told him one day, brother, I am going to tell the Lord on you that you're talking bad to the man of God. <laughs> I mean, he could bring them in, and Brother Miles and Brother, brother Nell all took a picture with one this long, and, and I said to them, man, y'all ought to be ashamed of yourself. Let me take a picture so the folk won't know I was there. <laughs> But what they didn't understand is that God had preserved them. That God had kept them. And the reason why they called it Sister Richard is because I was on the bank praying that the Lord blessed them. They called themselves fishermen. But they could not have caught a fish without me praying for them. And then every now and then one of you would call and say, man, put that phone down. But if they were on the other end, they would want me to answer it. And I want to say to you today, I can't preserve you. I can't protect you. But God puts a hedge of protection around us. So when you can't get in touch with your pastor, you ought to know how to call on God. Because God is the one who preserves. It is God's preservation. It is God's power that keeps us. My next point is found in verse number five. Verse number five declares, You, O Lord, are the portion of my inheritance. In my cup, you must maintain my lot. God's portion. Is what we all look forward to. God has an inheritance for us. For if we do right, God can bless us. But many of us are like the prodigal son. God bless me right now. And if you don't give it to me right now, just forget about it. None of my children would ever tell me something like that because they know I'm crazy enough to say, yeah, you're right. Let me go down here and talk to the insurance agent right now. And we can fix your problem. We can fix your problem right now. First of all, you don't, I don't deserve to do anything but give you, you comfort, give you education, to give you food, clothes, and shelter. And, and when I get out of here, I, the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children, children. But guess what? If I leave you $25, I've left you an inheritance. So don't go tripping. Don't go talking trash. But the Bible teaches that God is our portion. This word first portion simply means that God gives us our division. He is able to divide everything to us that we deserve. Or we, we have, he has made us to deserve. Because we really don't deserve anything. You see, because we are God's children, God keeps right on blessing us. Because God keeps blessing us, we come to the conclusion that we deserve something. 
but we deserve nothing. God is just our portion. And God gives us a portion of our inheritance today. And he will give a portion of our inheritance tomorrow. So you don't deserve an inheritance. God is just your portion. He, he gives you a bit. He gives you a division of it, of what you have deserved because you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior. I say to you today, we don't, we don't deserve anything because, because the fact of the matter is we are not saved because we are so good. We're not, we're not born again because we've been so righteous. We're only born again because of God's amazing grace. And because of God's amazing grace, we are who we are. We do what we do. We obey him like, like we do because God has given us a portion. The old saints used to say it like this. Lord, I thank you for a portion of my health and my strength because they understood very well that whatever God gives them, they don't deserve it and they are, they are conscious enough to thank God for a portion. And let me tell you, young folks, if you have not gotten to a point where you thank God for a portion of your health and strength, just keep waking up in the morning. I used to just get out of bed and, and jump up. I used to just spring up. I, I used to get up out of my seat and just jump up. And, and I didn't have to think about it. But now when I get up in the morning, before I get up, right after I thank God for another day, I got to stretch here, move here, maneuver there, get all the crooked places out. Because I know if I get up and I'm going to be so crooked and twist, twisted up, I can fall right back down. I'm telling you, I thank God for a portion of health and strength. In other words, it's not the health and strength I used to have, but God knows how to issue it out. He knows how to bless us the way he, he wants to bless us when we need blessing. So I thank him for a portion. A portion, not only for our strength, but a portion of my health and strength. God has blessed us. Let me tell you, even, even when I get to move from a chair now, after I've done my stretches, after I have moved around all day, and I may sit in a chair too long, the problem with some folks, the reason why they can't move, they've been sitting in the same place too long. They trying to be like the man at the pool of Bethesda. For 38 long years, they've been sitting there waiting on the troubling of the water. Let me tell you, God is not going to trouble any water unless you move. So sometimes when I sit there too long, I have to get up and, and twist before I get up. Y'all can laugh right now, but just keep on waking up. And then I have to twist this way in order to get up. And then when I get up, I don't pop up. I just slowly ease up because if I, if I jump up, Brother Mel off, sometime I find myself flat on the floor. And then I hear my inner self talking to my outer self. And it kind of sounds like this. I can hear, Sister Nalo, I can hear my inner self talking to my outer self and saying to my outer self, you think you're 25, but you better not move like it's 25. And my inner body will shut my outer body down if I try to move too fast. Any other witnesses in the house? Keep living, Sister Whitlock. Keep, just keep waking up in the morning. You won't be able to laugh at the old folk too long. Just keep living. Just keep living. I know you and Brother Whitlock, the, the alarm goes off, pew, they they off to the races. I mean, they just, pew. Young folk, they, they, they just do it, pew. I mean, they just off to the races. They, they just, I mean, it's gone. I have to set my alarm, and then I have to ask the Lord to wake me up a good 40 minutes before I need to be up. Because I got to lay there and thank him, first of all, and then I got to get think about how I'm going to get out of this bed. I'm talking about just getting out of the bed in the morning. I got to think which leg I'm going to move first, which arm I'm going to turn over, or which way I'm going to turn first, because if I do the wrong one at the wrong time on the wrong day, I'm messed up. So I thank God for a portion of my health and strength. I thank God that I just got 50%, I thank him for it. If I got 25%, I thank him for it. I just thank God for a portion. My next, my next point, my next point is found in verse number six. This is Psalm 16, verse number six. It says, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. 
Yes, I have a good inheritance. The third point is pleasant places. God has for us pleasant places. This phrase, pleasant places, means a delightful place. It, it, it means a, a place of rest, a place of contentment, a place where we don't have to worry about any more stuff. I can go to any house in this room, and you can walk around your house one time. I can find 10,000 things that are not necessary. Any house in this room, any, any house that's represented in this room. Because over a period of time, we honestly just gather up stuff. Yeah. We get back home, they call it whatnots. I mean, you, some folk got whatnots all over the place. Some people got old baseball, football cards, and they won't even cash me in. Talking about in 10 years, they're going to be more and more expensive. You better cash me in now because you not promised to be here in 10 years. And that other woman going to cash me in. <laughs> that other dude will cash me in for you. But God give us pleasant places. It means a place of rest. A place where we can be content. I want to just announce to you today, I'm content. I don't need any more anything. I'm, I'm content. Now, this is Pastor and, and Minister's Appreciation Month. And I thank y'all for what y'all have done. I thank y'all for what y'all are going to do. So don't let me cut myself out. <laughs> but I do want to let you know. I do want to let you know that I don't need... Much of anything. I don't need a car. I mean, preachers drive what they want to drive. I roll up in my M150. <laughs> and when, when they drive what they want to drive, when it floods, they wish they were driving what I'm driving. <laughs> You're right. You're right, brother. You're right. I, I roll up just as proud. I mean, I be dressed to the nine. I'm, I mean, I be so clean if you touch me, Brother Dixon. I'm the, I will cut you up. <laughs> I mean, you can do like that and you come back and you just bleeding all over the place. And I drive up with an F-150 and just as proud as the guy that drives up in, in a BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Lexus, or whatever they want to. And preachers ought to drive whatever they want to drive. Y'all stop hating on preachers. You don't hate on LeBron James. You don't hate on Michael Jordan. But at the end of the day, what will give you a pleasant life is what matters. And that pleasant life is a peaceful place. There are folk who have cow king beds. I found, that's a new phrase I found out because I never had one. Folk, there are folk who have cow king beds that are not getting an ounce of rest. All right. There are people who have big homes, that, that a big house rather, that is not a home. There are men who have many women. There are women who have many men, but they're always looking over their shoulder for something. There are dope dealers and prostitutes that got a lot of money, but they can't get an ounce of rest. But God gives us pleasant places. Pleasant places. Pleasant, a pleasant place. My, my next point is verse number, and it's found in, in, uh, in verse and I didn't even write down. My, my next point is praise. Verse number seven, where it says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night season. Praises unto the God. We ought to give praises unto the Almighty God. Brother Whitlock said we ought to give it to him before we get in the building. <laughs> when we enter his courts and when we enter his gates, we ought to praise him. And it ought not matter whether the musicians are playing hymns or contemporary music. Said Arch. It ought not matter whether the choir is in the law or not. We ought to come in the door praising him. The day 
is over, the day is out where somebody ought to have to pump and prime you in order for you to praise him. You ought to think about the goodness of the Lord and what he's already done for you. And your soul ought to cry out hallelujah to the yes. Lord. Praises unto him. This word bless means to praise, to salute. It means to give thanks, to give honor to the Lord. He says that I'm glad about it. He says the fact that God has been my counsel. God has been the one that counsels me. Everybody want to run to somebody else to see what they have to say, even though God has spoken to them already. In, in Mississippi, there, was, there used to be an old rundown, rundown uh, trailer house on the side of 82. And there were two women that practiced Terry cards, Ouija boards, and they're going to tell you their sign, your sign, and they're going to tell you your future. And one of those rundown places was from uh, Miss Delmar. And let me tell you, I, I ain't very smart. I'm not the, the sharpest knife in the draw, Brother Miles. But one thing I do know, if you're going to show me how to be prosperous, you ought not be operating out of a rundown trailer house. If you can read my future, you ought to have every lotto number that shows up. People have spent billions of dollars to go to Miss Delmar and Miss Teresa for them to tell them their future, and they live it like they're two steps from poverty. Why would I go into a house, not even a house? Why would I go into a trailer, a rundown trailer, sit across the table from somebody that's going to tell me my future when she ain't even got her future intact? And people spend billions, I mean, it just makes common sense. I told you, I'm not the sharpest knife in the draw, but I do know if you are prosperous, you can tell me how to get there. I do know if you're unprosperous, something went wrong somewhere. There's a dead cat on the line somewhere. You just making money off of folk. You, you just, when a person drive what they want to drive, live what they want to live, do what they want to do, it doesn't say that they're walking with the Lord, but it does say that they have accomplished something in their life. Example, it says that they made some accomplishments. You taking my audience, example. It says, it says that they have accomplished something, and maybe, just maybe, they can show me how to accomplish something. Yes, so who are you going to praise? Sister Teresa or Miss Delmar? I'm going to praise him. The psalmist says in Psalm 100, we ought to make a joyful shout, a joyful noise. We ought to make a joyful cry, a cry to him. Yes. Now there are two games on the day. There was about seven on yesterday. And there were thousands on Friday night. And there were hundreds on Thursday night. Games, just games, just football games. Everything from Little League to Pony League to Pro to Semi-Pro. Uh, and there are two major games in the professional realm on today. And the same dudes, the same guys, they say, I, I don't get down like that when they come to church. That I, I, I'm too cool for that when they come to church. The moment, the moment, the moment, the moment a touchdown is scored, and the moment a field goal has won a game, you're going to hear reaction from both sides. Some reaction is going to be speaking in tongues with long language and short language. Other reaction is going to be, yes, yes, we got it. Did you see that? Man, watch the replay. But in church, when it's time to praise the Lord, the preacher got to get up and say, come on, y'all. Come on over here. Is, is that part over here? Come on over here. Let me just tell you, at the new beginning church, we ought not be priming and priming. We ought to be able to, to come before the Lord and just think about his goodness and salute him. To thank him, to honor him, be glad. He says, my heart is merry. My heart is glad. The Lord makes my heart glad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we praise him, we make his heart glad. Yeah. 
So we, we, we didn't come to see who's wearing what. We didn't come to see who's with who. We didn't come to see, and we glad visitors to show up, but we didn't come to see who's going to visit on this Sunday. We have come to give our honor, give our praise, give glory to the one only true God, the one that we serve, the one who keeps us, the one that puts a hedge around us, the one who's been with us from day in and day out, the one that was with us when our family walked out on us, our friends became few. We came I'm going to lift the name of Jesus. And we ought to glorify him. If we can't think about who he is, we ought to glorify him for what he's already done. He's a good God. That's why when the Jehovah's Witness pulled me over, I said, yeah, I, I'm a Jehovah's Witness too. I worship Jehovah. I serve Jehovah. I praise Jehovah. And because God Jehovah is there for me, he's been there for me. I honor him even in your presence. Yes. So when Jehovah's Witnesses come by your house, don't break and run and tell them, tell them I'm not here. You just go to lifting your hands, worshiping Jehovah God, and praising him for who he is, and thanking him for what he's already done. Amen. And when you do that, God is glorified. And we have made the difference. The next point, the next point is verse number seven, Psalm 16, verse number seven. I will bless the Lord, who is my counsel. I praise him. I will glorify him. Verse number eight. I set, I have, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not move. I shall not be moved. God, God is, is present. And when God is present, he knows how to move so that we can move. One songwriter says, when, when you move, I move just like that. Did I just take myself? When, when he moves, I move just like that. In other words, if God never moves, you ought not be moving. If, if God never uh, changes his direction, you ought not change your direction. So many people are locked up because of embezzlement, because somebody else challenged them, they moved unrighteously, and they didn't move in the will of God. Let me just tell you, young people, if it doesn't belong to you, leave it alone. If it doesn't belong to you, don't touch it. If it doesn't belong to you, get away from it. Don't pick it up. I don't care if it's laying on the side of the road. It's not yours. Leave it alone. Wait for God to move. And God knows how to move, sisters and brothers. He knows how to move and bless us when we can't be blessed on our own. He knows how to move. He, he know, and, and, and he says, he says that I will not be moved. I will not be confounded by the evilness of this world. A few verses up, the, the psalmist talks about the fact that those who are not walking with God, they have that day. Psalm 73 says it like this. He says, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked. And when I looked at the prosperity of the wicked, I saw how blessed think they thought they were blessed. I saw all of their accomplishments. And I wanted, I, I wanted to be, my feet was almost gone. My steps had well not slipped. But then I went into the house of the Lord and the, the Lord told me and showed me in the house of the Lord that wicked will come to destruction. The wicked will come to destruction and wickedness will come into destruction. And when I went into the house of the Lord, I realized that I got a place with God. Amen. A present place, a, a pleasant place, a place with the Lord. Leads me to my next point. My next point is verse number nine. It says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also has rest and hope. Let me tell you, there's nothing better than rest. There's nothing better than hope. You got to hope in something. Put your hope in the Lord. Rest in him. People still ask me today, Dad, they have been gone since 2015. They still ask me today, man, 
Are you human? How do you do that? You and your dad were close. Y'all did things together. And you tell stories how y'all worked together. Spend time together. How did you stand there and preach his funeral and not even flinch? Then my nephew said, I didn't see you shed not one tear until the casket was going down in the ground. You have to learn to rest in the Lord. You have to learn that God is still in control. And regardless of what God chooses to do or what God chooses to let happen, he's still on the throne. People ask me, what do you think about Trump getting, becoming president? I said, God is still on the throne. What, what, what if it happens again? God, as long as God is still on the throne. I'm not worried about who the president is. I'm not worried about who the governor is. I'm not worried about any government mandate. God is on the throne. And when God is on the throne, I honor God. And God knows how to fix it. Right. Yeah. And he's working behind the scene to make it right. <laughs> he's fixing it right now. Matter of fact, while we trying to figure it out, God already got it worked out. <laughs> God got to work out. So, so don't get excited. Don't get overbearing. Don't get so mixed up in your emotion when they, they legislate in sin. You just keep talking to God about it. Amen. Don't get excited when your family members give in to sin and your friends give in to sin. Your neighbors just keep talking to God about it. Yeah, that's right. Because God is yet on the throne. Yes, yes. Yeah, in, in verse, verse number nine, he gives us protection. Gives us protection. He, he gives us protection. The, the psalmist says, my, my heart is glad. I, I'm just so joyful about it. And, I mean, sometimes God calms the storm. But many times God calms the child in the midst of the storm. Let me tell you, we, we love the story where Jesus stepped out in Mark chapter 4. How Jesus stepped out and said, peace be still. And the winds and the waves laid down. I heard preachers preaching and they get really hooping. They said, the winds and the waves laid down and went to sleep like a newborn baby. We love that story. And I want God to come in my troubles like that, where he can speak in the winds and the waves laid down. But let me just share with you. Sometimes God calms the storm. But many times, he calmed the child in the midst of the storm. The songwriter said, if these storms do not cease, and if the winds keep right on blowing, my soul is anchored. My soul is anchored in the Lord. You have to anchor. You have to have your soul anchored. You, you got to realize that he's our protection. Yes, sir. He's our protection. Then, verse number 11, verse number 10, but you will not leave my soul in shear. He, he talks about the fact that God won't let his bones rot in hell. This word hell is not the hell that you know of. This word hell, shield, this word hell means the, the common grave. David is saying to us today that there's a way even out of the grave. God protects us. God keeps us. He offers us a way out even from the grave. So verse number 11 says that God will show us the path of life. God will show us the path of life. And this path of life that God will show us is one that we need to hold on to. We need to make sure that when God shows us this path, he will show us the right road. This word path is road. He will show us the right direction. Stop doing stuff and watch God. Stop sitting around doing nothing and watch God. You ought to be attentive to the path of God. God has a path that leads to life. He will show you the path of life. He will show you the right road to take. It is dangerous for you to get up early in the morning and just start doing stuff. It is dangerous for you to get on the road on your way to work without spending time with God. It is dangerous for you to approach your spouse, your friend, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your neighbor. It is dangerous for you to approach them without checking in with God. Because when you check in with God, he, he lays your day out. He, he, he lays your path out. He, 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 he puts the angels before you and behind you. He, he lays it all out for you. One lady that's usually late to church, 
I ain't talking about y'all, but, but it's this it just sliding on. One lady that was always, she was always late to church. I mean, she was always late. So she was determined this one Sunday, I'm gonna be on time. And let me tell you, being on time is not getting out the car. Being on time is on your post. Being on time is in your seat. Being on time is standing where you are standing. Being on time is watching other folk come in that say they're on time. This lady decided that she was going to be on time. You ought to try it sometime. You ought to try it. You ought to try it sometime. It's, it's, it's a magnificent thing. It's mind blowing. It's, it's, it's awesome to get along with God early in the morning. The psalmist said, I will seek you early in the morning, Lord. He says, this lady was on time this day. Meaning that she was on her post. It meaning that she was where she's supposed to be. It meaning that she was there before time. Somebody asked the question the other day. They came in. It was, it was 1029. We started at 1030. And I'm already up doing the devotion. It's like, now I struggled to get here. And now, and the, and the lady outside, the young lady outside said, oh, well, they, they started early. It's not until you start early that you're on time. It's not until you start before time that you're on time. Don't show up at an interview on time. You got a nine o'clock interview, don't show up at nine o'clock. Don't let them see you put your, your jacket on outside. When, you, when they get there, you ought to be there. So this lady decided she was gonna be on time this morning. And bless the Lord, right the train track that she has to come by. The train left the track. And right where she would have been sitting, she's supposed to be in here, not, not y'all, man, at the church around the corner down the street. She's supposed to be in that church at 9 o'clock. And she used to sit at that track at 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, the train got disconnected. It came off the rail. And there were three cars lined up right there. It took out all three cars, and there was a total wipeout. Everybody get, got killed. And it's only because she had chosen to be on time one time in, in 52 years. She had chosen to be on time one time out of all the years she'd been going to church. And God spared her and blessed her that one time. Because she usually, she's the second call. She can't go forward. She came back up. She's using the second call. And when you can't go forward and you can't back up and a train jumps the track, and guess what? It takes out all three, then you hit the shore. And that Sunday, that woman came to church and, and, and she got back, she left church, went back home, and, and she, she heard what happened. She First thing she said, what time was it? The police officer said it was 9 a.m. And the next Sunday when she showed up at church, guess what time she showed up? At 8.45 a.m. <laughs> And they couldn't hold her. Brother Willard, they couldn't set her down. She drowned, grabbed instruments. She ran around the church thanking God and praising God for being her protection and giving her another path. Let me tell you. Sister said, brother, every time you try to get late, every time you think you got to get this piece of hair straightened up or put on or snapped on white, every time you put an extra minute into it, just think about that woman. If I be on time, I can praise the Lord. If I can be on time, he can protect me. If I be on time, God can give me the path of life. He says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. My next point to you is, you ought to be in God's presence. Be found in God's presence. Be in the presence of God because there is fullness of excitement, full of dedication. There is fullness of joy. Be excited about being in God's presence. The reason why our world, our nation, is in the shape that it's in, not because of unbelievers, it's because of believers are not in the presence of God. Before the Lord's face early in the morning. Before the Lord's face late at night. Getting up out of bed in the middle of the night before the face in the presence of God. This word presence means his countenance. His be in God's presence. Be before God. Spend your time in the presence of God because in his presence is the fullness of joy. I'm not talking about just being happy. I'm talking about joy. 
That's what it's all about. Regardless of what you go through in this life, regardless of how many family members pass away, you need the fullness of joy. I mean, being able to have a storm going on on the outside, but on the inside, you got peace. You got joy. Being able to shout in the midst of it. Being able to praise God in the midst of it. Being able to honor him in the midst of it. Because in his presence, there's fullness of joy. I can tell when church folk been in the fullness of, good, of God, in the fullness of joy. I can tell when folk been in the presence of God. I tried Sister Brown this morning. She seemed like she kind of been in the presence of God. She walked in this morning. I said, what is it, Sister Brown? How can I help you? What do you want? And she stayed studying. I said, Phew. thank God she got in the presence of God this morning. Because <laughs> if she had not been in God's presence, she would have pushed me into his presence. Because let me tell you, sisters know how to roll their neck, roll their head, shake their eyes, and put their hands on their hip and tell you where you need to go. But I put her to the test this morning. And she spared me. Evidently, she's been in the presence of God. So she was full of joy. At your right hand, are pleasures forever. At your right hand, God has pleasures for us forever. I, I think I've told women before, don't get excited about being in the presence of a man. Men, don't get excited about being in the presence of a particular woman because it's all temporary. <laughs> and when it comes to men, I mean, this, this, this 10 minutes is over, it's, it's done. When you're in the presence of a woman, five, ten minutes, it's gone. It's over. It's temporary. And it doesn't matter how she clowns or how he clowns. It is all temporary. We need to be in the presence of the Lord. In his right hand is his power. And in his right hand, in God's right hand, there are pleasures from now on. Don't get caught up in worldly pleasures. Walk with God. Spend time with him. And he can give you pleasure. Now when David penned these words, he talks about how God is not going to leave him in the grave. What he's saying is what the apostle Peter talked about in his sermon in Acts. Not only is he saying that God would not leave him in the grave. He's also saying that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus went down in the grave. What he's saying is, because of Jesus, over 2,000 years ago, God didn't leave him in the grave, and God is not going to leave you there either. Right. For the Bible teaches that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, died for you. He died for me on a skull hill called Calvary. Jesus, over 2,000 years ago, took a cross, he took a stick, he took a stake, and he marched up Calvary's hill. He died on that hill over 2,000 years ago. Amen. Oh, they took him off the cross, I tell you. They, they took him off the cross. They laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. It was a barber tomb because out of that third day morning, Jesus the Christ rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Jesus knows how to upset the graveyard. He, he knows how to put the graveyard on notice. You see, in Mark chapter 5, there's a man that's running crazy in the graveyard. Jesus shows up in verse number 6, and the man runs to him, bows down before him, and Jesus set him straight in the graveyard. In the book of John, you, you read about Lazarus, and, and Lazarus was in the graveyard. He was dead. He was so dead. He was thinking. He was there for four whole days. He was thinking in the grave. Folk had given up on him. Martha and Mary said, we know we'll see our brother again in the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus knows how to upset the graveyard. And then over 2,000 years ago, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He upset the graveyard again. But the good news today, my dears, is Jesus going to upset the graveyard one more time? The 
same Jesus that died, the same Jesus that buried, the same Jesus that rose from the dead, caught a cloud and got out of here. He's making intercession for you and me on the right hand of the Father. But the good news is, one of these old days, the trump of God will sound. One of these old days, the trump of God will sound. The voice of the archangel will be so loud until Jesus will upset the graveyard one more time. The Bible said he will crack the sky and the dead in Christ who died in Christ will rise first and yes, he will upset the graveyard one more time. God knows, Jesus knows how to put the graveyard on warning. He put the graveyard on notice that you're not the grave that you can keep back. And when Jesus comes back, those of us who are walking around that died with the light of hope in Jesus Christ, we may be buried in the grave, but when the trump of God sounds, our bodies will rise again. And we will forever meet him in the air. And the Bible says we will forever be with the Lord. Don't worry about the graveyard. The graveyard is for this, folks. We are alive. God offers us a pathway to life. And it is God's pathway that we are concerned. The door of the church is open. Invitation you ought to try Jesus. He has the path of life. He preserves us. He gives us his portion. He has better places for us. We ought to praise him. He protects us. He offers us a pathway of life. In his presence is full of joy. And there are pleasures when we walk with God. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, have you been, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. You need to get to know him. The door is open. The invitation is next time. We offer Christ to you. Oh, my brother.
Lord, we praise the name of Jesus. Listen, wake up.
have a card here that says thank you from the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another john 1 16. may you be blessed for the kindness you've shown me be blessed sister arlene wade this is the mother of sister irving and brother dixon she turned 100 100 100 years old she turned 100 years old and we want to thank god for 100 years of, of blessing her i already asked sister irving is she gonna look that good when she get to be 100 I don't know if she told me the truth or not, but she said yes, yeah, so I have to go with what she said. Amen. During our prayer time, we're, we're praying, we're praying for um, the bereaved family, or Brenda, the Brenda family, and the Garza family, and the death of Mario Brenda. We're also praying on our prayer list, we have Alvin Powell, Rusheen Marilyn, Lula Richard, and Ali Warren. We are lifting all of them in our prayers. Let's go to God. Father God, we thank you now. We bless you. We know you're the great physician. You're the healer. You're the comforter of our soul. We come praying for these who are before us, these names that we call. Comfort these who read. Heal those who are sick and bless those who are confused. Give them comfort in their mind, their hearts, and their souls. Bear them up as only you can. Touch them as only you can. Bless their lives, Father God, that they will be beacon lights for others to see. So in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank you. We want to thank the Bubs for being with us today. Uh, we want to thank the Bubs for being with us. Amen. Thank you for, for being with us. This is, this is my oldest brother and his, and his wife. And every time you see them together, she just makes him look good. Uh, you can tell by the head, he's my oldest brother, can't you? <laughs> Amen. Sister, Sister Bub, thank you for being a part of our service. Sister Irene Bub is the lady that took me in when I was homeless, his mom took me in, and I was homeless. When I say homeless, I mean without a house, Brother Nanlock. Look at me like that. I'm talking about nowhere to live, Brother Nanlock. I mean, something that you never taste, Brother Nanlock. And my nearest house was 600 miles away. And she took me in at the right age of 80-something, 80 82, 83, she took me in. And I got married out of her house. I got mad at that. So that's my mama and that's my little, my big brother. That's my big brother. So uh, I want to thank thank God for their visitation on today. Brother Miles, if you would get the cross, we will, we will prepare for communion. We want to thank God for the privilege of communion. We want to thank God for the, the opportunity to eat and to drink. Jesus has, has blessed us. Yeah, yeah, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, ask everybody to come on in so we can commune together. Everybody come on in so we can commune together. Father God, to bless us that we will not bring damnation to our souls. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. We confess our sins. We ask you to bless the bread, the breast, the drink. We pray, Father God, that we see Jesus as who he is and who he is alone. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Praise God. Praise God.
him, this is my body. Uh, it is broken for you. And he said, this is my cup. And he says, as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. First impression.
place to come for you to put your empties in. Thank you. 